patience. We are waiting for the sun to set, but we won't make you wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is a bright space and it's warm today, so we're going to jump right into it. And I apologize for having to make you strain a bit to see the slides, but we will provide them afterwards as part of the recording of this event. So first of all, my name is Savlan Hauser. I'm the executive director of the Jack London Improvement District. And uh, we love having these events to talk about interesting uh, issues of, of importance to the Jack London community and Oakland, and uh, can I get the board members, if there are board members here, please reveal yourselves. Paul and Michael are in the back. Any other board members are here? And uh, thank you also to the elected officials who are here. Uh, Richard Raya is here representing Council Member Abel Guillen, uh, and Robert Rayburn representing the entire BART system. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, any other, any, did I miss any other electeds? Um, could I get a quick show of hands to let our speakers know who they are speaking to? How many people here are neighbors, just happen to live a few blocks away and this is the most interesting thing to do on a Tuesday? <laughs> uh, how many of you are sort of involved in the industry, somehow you might be affected because you might get some planning work or uh, landscaping work maybe? or? Come on, you might. <laughs> Wonderful, Don't be great. Uh, how many of you uh, are affiliated with the A's? Anybody? No? <laughs> okay, um, interesting. So, uh, thank you so much to our hosts, Ryan, Max, and Caitlin, and Margie. They are so generous to host us in this uh, soon to be home of Original Pattern Brewing, hopefully in about two months. And uh, I'll let them uh, tell you a few words about it after, after our talk. Um, hope you come back soon and often. And uh, so we all can acknowledge that locating the ballpark downtown is a pretty big deal. It comes along maybe once in a, I don't know, generation. And it will have undeniable impacts of economic activity and infrastructure improvements. And so what's interesting to us at this moment is how do we, where do we fit in? How do we get involved? How do we leverage this opportunity? How do we make it unique and really ab about Oakland? And so we brought together some of the best and brightest. The local, the, this local team ha happens to also be the you know, international experts on the subject. I'm gonna uh, pass it off to Ro uh, Robert Gammon um, and then he'll introduce the rest of the panelists. Um, I'm going to read his very impressive bio. He is a news editor for both East Bay Express and the Oakland Magazine. He's been a journalist for over 20 years, and uh, he's won numerous awards for investigative reporting, including the Society of Professional Journalists Award of Northern California and the Casey Medal for In-Depth Journalism. Before joining the Express, Gammon was also the investigative reporter of the Oakland Tribune and has ri written extensively about the A's recently. I hope you've all been enjoying his journalism as much as I have. So handing it off, and thank you all again so much for coming. Thanks, Sablin. Um, so tonight we have uh, three guests. We have Jeff Balasario. He's the vice president of the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. His research in interests lie in the intersection of community development and finance, and his past projects include analyses of Bay Area housing programs, public-private partnerships for infrastructure, and the economic impacts of transportation investments. Jeff holds a MPP degree from UC Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy and a BS in Finance from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Michael Byrne is one of the North American's leading experts on downtown Main Street retailing. He's the founder and president of MGB Consulting, a retail planning and real estate consultancy hired by a wide range of public, nonprofit, and private sector clients internationally to undertake market analyses, devise tenant strategies, and spearhead implementation efforts. Michael is a regular speaker at the annual conferences of the International Downtown Association, the International Council of Shopping Centers, and has appeared in numerous high-profile publications, including the Financial Times, the Washington Post, the Street, Oakland, and San Francisco Chronicle. Michael was born and bred a New Yorker and a lifelong Mets fan. Yes. Uh, we might forgive you for that, Mike. 
Uh, and Noah Friedman, our final guest, is a, urban, a senior urban designer with over 15 years of experience in urban design, architecture, and real estate development from affordable housing to urban design. He has led the design and planning of landmark projects such as Treasure Island and the national, internationally acclaimed ZB, one of the world's most sustainable communities, and the notable, notable Mission Rock development working with the SF Giants. Noah is committed to performance-based design, placemaking, sustainability, and equity. Uh, before we start with our speakers, I thought we'd give a brief, I'd give a brief interview, uh, overview of how we got here today. I've been covering the A's since, and their stadium issues since the mid-1990s. Um, back then, the Coliseum was actually considered a decent facility for baseball. It had the best grass in the majors, still does. Uh, great weather and a beautiful view of the East Bay Hills. But then in 1995, the city of Oakland and Alameda County decided to remodel the Coliseum in order to bring the Raiders back from Los Angeles. Unfortunately, the remodel basically ruined the Coliseum for baseball. Mount Davis completely blocked the beautiful view of the hills and this supplanted the popular and extensive outfield bleachers. In the years following, then owners Steve Schott and Ken Hoffman began looking to the South Bay to build a new ballpark. Schott zeroed in on Santa Clara at a site near where the 49ers play today. But Schott was stymied by the Giants' control over the territorial rights to the South Bay. In Oakland, then city manager Robert Bob began advocating for an A's ballpark in Updown near the Fox Theater. Bob had hired HOK architects to survey sites in Oakland, including Howard Terminal next to Jack Lennon Square and Laney College. HOK concluded that the upside site was the be Uptown site was the best. However, then Mayor Jerry Brown wanted housing for the Uptown site, and he blocked Bob's plan and eventually fired him over it. Schott and Hoffman then sold the A's to John Fisher and Lou Wolf. A developer with a strong South Bay ties, Wolf later acknowledged that the Uptown site would have been the perfect spot for the A's, but it was no longer available. Wolf then retraced HOK steps, examining sites throughout Oakland. He eventually focused on a spot just north of the Coliseum where he said he wanted to build a ballpark village. However, the city ultimately turned down that plan because it would have caused direct displacement of businesses in the area. Wolf then set his sights on Fremont for a ballpark village there. He purchased land there and was looked for time that the team would become the Fremont A's. But then Wolf abandoned his proposal after Fremont's residents came out against that plan, mostly citing traffic concerns. Wolf then turned to San Jose, but he too was ultimately blocked by the Giants' rights to the South Bay. In Oakland, ballpark pro, uh, proposals emerged for Jack Lennon District, both in Howard Terminal, near Jack Lennon Square, and at Victory Court, which is on the other side of Oak Street. Mayor Gene Kwan also pushed for a ballpark village at the Coliseum property called Coliseum City, which would have featured new facilities for the A's and the Raiders, but Lou Wolf wasn't interested. Then everything changed last fall when Wolf decided to shell his, sell his shares in the A's and John Fisher appointed Dave Cavill as team president. Cavill immediately launched a ballpark search in Oakland. Like HOK 15 years before, Cavill quickly concluded there were three viable sites, Laney College, specifically the Peralta Community College District headquarters, Howard Terminal, and the Coliseum. Earlier this month, Cavill announced that the Peralta site, Laney College, was the best choice. So tonight we're gonna to start off with Jeff Belisario. Jeff? All right, thank you very much. Uh, so I work for a think tank, uh, so we like to think about things. So I'm gonna to try to add some numbers, uh, add some economics to this discussion. Um, we do a lot of economic impact analysis, a lot of times for transportation, uh, big infrastructure projects, and we happen to do one here for the A's. Um, so we released this report, which uh, you can see the cover up there maybe, uh, back over the summer, an economic impact of the A's in Oakland. Uh, what's actually funny about this, this is from a walk-off win earlier in the year. I think maybe two of these players remain on the roster. So it's, <laughs> it's been a tough year for the A's, but I think the, the stadium is uh, providing some energy into the offseason here. Um, so this is going to be tough to see, but this report uh, found that the economic impact of an A's new stadium in Oakland would bring about $3 billion of economic activity to the city. Um, so that's not a new number. The A's currently have some economic impact, but we took uh, the construction spending, uh, the in-game patron spending, uh, along with the team operational spending. Um, if you run that through uh, various economic models, you come up with this $3 billion number over 10 years. Um, so that's new money coming into the city of Oakland. Uh, we know that right now the vast majority of Oakland ticket holders for the A's are not actually from the city of Oakland. They come in from places like the Tri-Valley, Dublin Pleasanton. They come in from Walnut Creek. Uh, they come from Berkeley, like myself. Um, so that this is new money coming into the Oakland, in, Oakland economy. And the other big piece here is on the potential for an increase in attendance. Uh, we looked at new stadiums from across the major leagues. 
Uh, about 20 of them have been built in the last 20 years or so. I think the exact number is 17. Many of them are in downtown areas, and that's caused an increase in attendance. You get more people living downtown, uh, more people employed downtown, and these stadiums become kind of the attraction. Uh, you look at PNC Park in Pittsburgh, San Diego Pet Petco Park. These are not great teams, uh, yet they still every year generate pretty decent attendance. Uh, this year, the A's are going to come in just under 1.5 million. Um, our model shows that in year one, they could get up to 2.5 million. Uh, this is all very dependent on the performance of the team, obviously, but we think in year one, you do tend to see a very big attendance boost, and that does bring in more spending. So that's kind of the argument for the A's. Like, this is why they would want to build a new stadium. You get more people in, increase your payroll, you have a better team. Then there's this argument for why would the city of Oakland want a new stadium? What are the benefits to the city? Um, and really, you look across the league and you look at cities that have done this, and it's potential for three things. First, it's that spillover spending. If you have people coming into a downtown ballpark, they're not just parking their car, going in, and then leaving, right? They're going to the bar, the restaurant before or after the game, spending more, supporting local business. Uh, number two up there is the potential for development around a stadium. So this could be residential, commercial, retail. Um, a stadium really signals that a, an, an area can be developed. Uh, it brings a concentration of people to it, and it brings dollars to it. And then lastly, uh, many places have created entirely new entertainment districts where a stadium gets paired with you know, movie theater, mini golf, another stadium, and it really is a place that is used not just 81 days per year for baseball, but for the entire year. Uh, so I, I did have one chart. You know, I, we do economics, so we have to have one chart. This is the, this is the one chart you'll see all night. Um, these are four other cities that have relocated stadiums downtown. Uh, this is Miami, Washington, D.C., San Diego, and uh, my, my Indi Minneapolis, sorry, the Twins. Uh, so the, the green bars here, which are higher than the gold bars, are green bars are the employment within the zip code of the stadium. The gold bars are the metro area employment gains in the time since the new stadium was built. Uh, in three of the four cases, you see employment concentrating near the stadium. So there can be employment gains. Uh, but the point here also is that San Diego, the bars are even. San Diego built a stadium downtown, often credited with redeveloping the entire downtown area, but it didn't bring any new jobs. So it's very much about how you do this, what you build around the stadium, uh, and what you make that land available for. Uh, so I just want to run through real quickly um, some other stadium projects. You could probably see these better in the slides that uh, you can get afterwards. Uh, this is San Diego. Um, there are holes in the ground around the stadium back in 2004 when it opened. Uh, today, they have built 15,000 new residential units. So while there aren't necessarily new jobs here, this is now a residential hub for San Diego, bringing more people downtown. In DC, they use the stadium for revitalization. Uh, this is kind of the southeastern corner of DC. Used to be the old Navy Yards. Uh, there wasn't a lot there. It's kind of a high crime neighborhood. Uh, they put the stadium there along with some other incentives to provide commercial development. And now this is becoming a second job center for DC. Um, it's right next to a metro station, very walkable and very livable. Uh, in Minneapolis, they've created a sports district. Uh, you've got the baseball stadium within walking distance from downtown, a basketball arena there as well. The one data point from here, this has been huge for the restaurants and bars, if any of you are restaurants and bars owners. The liquor tax receipts in downtown Minneapolis have gone up 20% in the years following the stadium. So people are coming, staying, drinking, and eating, and the city gets more money from it. Uh, this is Miami. I, I'm titled this Making the Neighbors Angry. This is a recent stadium that was plopped down uh, kind of in the middle of residential <coughs> Miami. Two parking lots put next to it. Uh, has done nothing for economic development. Has not necessarily been a success story, and neither have the Marlins. And then lastly, uh, this is the newest stadium in the major leagues. This is Atlanta. Um, and really, this is kind of reviving the highway stadium story. Uh, back in the 60s, 70s, a lot of stadiums were built along highways to really push people outside of the city. Easy access via highway. You come in on your car, in your car, and then leave in your car. Uh, the Braves are kind of recreating that, but they're creating an entertainment district ne right next to the highway. So almost an entirely new district of baseball, uh, hotels. Uh, there's restaurants there all on new land. So not a downtown example, uh, but another example of what can be done around a stadium. Um, so I, I do just kind of want to leave you with three things that we see in all of these stadiums and that the A's are thinking about as they're looking at their new stadium project. One is transportation. How do people get to and from the game? That'll dictate some of the development that can happen around it. Uh, two is land use. What type of land uses are available near the stadium? Do high rises make sense? Low rises maybe make <clears> sense? <throat> can you do commercial? Can you do retail? 
And then lastly, it's concentrations of employment and population. So the employment concentration is good if you want to be growing employment and bringing those people to the game. The population concentration becomes a little difficult because the baseball use does not necessarily mesh with that high population area. That's all I got. Um, you couldn't see any of that, but uh, <laughs> happy to answer questions later. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, our next guest, I think, uh, Michael, you want to go next? Yes. This is Michael Byrne. Yep. Did I go? No, did you want to go next, or was Michael? No, I'm go okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry for the heat. Um, thank you for being long enough that it looks like the sun has started to set, so you might be able to see a little more of my presentation. Um, full disclosure, yes, I am a Mets fan, although as a current resident in Berkeley. Uh, I consider myself an adopted A's fan. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> um, so I've done a lot of work as a consultant in, uh, in downtowns which uh, have or are very much dominated by their stadiums or arenas, what have you. Um, everywhere from downtown Cleveland, um, downtown Winnipeg, downtown Tampa, uh, which is um, not always baseball, it could be hockey, um, but done a lot of work in these sorts of settings. And you might be asking, well, why do we have a retail consultant on this panel? Um, we're talking about baseball, we're talking about sports. Well, um, as you've already heard, uh, retail plays a pretty important role in all this. Um, when you do get these ballpark villages uh, adjacent to stadiums, uh, they become critical to the experience that you have, uh, the uniqueness. Uh, of, of the place, um, the financial stability uh, of the uh, overall development as well as the team. Um, and in this case, uh, it actually will also be relevant to the future of Jack London Improvement District and Jack London Square in ways that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say a few things about. Um, when we talk about old school urban or downtown ballparks, uh, the model we usually have in our mind's eye is Wrigleyville in Chicago, right? It was built there in 1914, uh, second oldest stadium in Major League Baseball after Fenway Park, um, and a true urban neighborhood really grew around it. Uh, and, and to the present day, where it's now filled with bars and restaurants that cater to the pre and post-game crowds, and there are other examples of kind of organically, uh, 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 organically created um, ballpark districts, whether it's Coors Field uh, and the area surrounding that in Lodo and Denver, so on and so forth. But what you're seeing a lot more of uh, lately is uh, an actual development called a ballpark village, which is uh, usually developed by one entity. Uh, the team itself is often the master developer, if not just a partner. Um, and it's a walkable district directly adjacent to the ballpark with bars, restaurants, other entertainment venues. And um, as we've already heard, uh, it's developed partly to generate an additional source of revenue uh, that can help to pay down some of the initial construction costs and ensure competitive product on the field, which is always, or has at least in recent times, been an ongoing issue uh, for the A's. Uh, in addition, the purpose of these villages has been to broaden the appeal of the experience beyond just hardcore baseball fans, um, so that you get a wider swath of the population uh, coming um, and, and, and purchasing. One nearby example of this, which most of you probably are familiar with, is uh, San Francisco Giants' efforts with Mission Rock, uh, which is a mega development that they are planning uh, on parking lot A next to AT&T Park. Um, but the ones that you see more often across the country, a lot of them are developed by a company called the Cordish Companies out of Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> they developed Ballpark Village next to Bush Stadium in downtown St. Louis. Uh, they're behind Xfinity Live, uh, which is in South Philadelphia. Um, and they're building two right now, one which was already mentioned, uh, SunTrust Park in Atlanta. Uh, as well as Globe Life Park in Dallas-Fort Worth. That's where the Texas Rangers play, for those of you who can't keep track of sponsorships. Um, and they're, they're really kind of exporting this model to markets across the country. Um, now, something like this, not Cordis specifically, but something like this is likely going to be a part of the program for this new A's ballpark. The A's have already said in discussing the preferred site that they also want to develop this sort of ballpark village 
on a parking lot nearby with some of the revenue presumably uh, going to Laney College. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to make a few points about these projects um, to think about as we start in on this, uh, on this uh, long uh, process <clears throat> of, of, uh, of finalizing a, you know, a ballpark uh, here in Oakland. Uh, one, you have to know that you know, 35,000 people uh, would be attending these games, um, and maybe more if, uh, if the stadium is converted into a concert venue, as many of these stadiums often are. And when you're talking 35,000 people, that's going to be a pretty diverse crowd. It's going to encompass the broadest possible of ages, life stages, income levels, tastes, right? And for that reason, an important, um, an important thing to keep in mind here is that this retail, this ballpark village, not be narrowly confined to one submarket, but, but rather really retain a broad-based crossover appeal. And I say this because, frankly, this is not something the Bay Area is very good at. Um, we tend to think that high-profile developments, you know, we, we give it an upmarket food hall, some pretentious coffee bars, um, some expensive locally made and handcrafted goods, and we call it a day, like a ferry building, for instance. Uh, and we forget that this type of retail does not appeal to everybody, and especially everybody who attends sporting events or rock concerts. Um, if you look at Xfinity Live in Philadelphia, for instance, uh, instead of a premium or artisanal restaurant, uh, they feature Geno Steaks, which any of you are familiar with. Philadelphia is one of the two iconic cheesesteak purveyors. Uh, and, and something that seems uh, certainly more appropriate uh, to Phillies fans, let me tell you. As a Mets fan, I know how rowdy and uncouth they can be. Geno Steaks fits right in. Um, another important reason why we need to think very broad-based about this is as a hedge of sorts. And what do I mean by that? Well, districts anchored by stadiums, you have to remember, um, they don't get any foot traffic if there's not a game, right? So a baseball team plays 81 home games a year, maybe five or ten more if they get to the playoffs. Um, at most, that's just one-fourth of the calendar. So three out of every four nights, it's dark, right? Um, and yet food and beverage offerings, restaurants, bars, they generally need patronage on a much more regular and predictable basis than that. Um, so it's important, it's essential um, to generate foot traffic from other anchors, uh, other uses that can draw throughout the week, throughout the day, throughout the year, and not just on game nights, like live music venues, for instance, or on-site residential office or hotel. Um, at Ballpark Village, the phase two will include uh, residential and office that will supplement demand, um, supplement the consumer demand uh, when that stadium itself is dark. And finally, and, and this is going to become very important in the discussion surrounding the stadium, more foot traffic can also be generated by concepts, by restaurants and bars that appeal directly to the already existing residential neighborhoods surrounding the stadium which in the case of the Laney College site, um, or sorry, the Peralta headquarters site, uh, points to the diverse precincts of, of Chinatown and Eastlake. Now, finally, um, all of this I just said presents three practical challenges that we'll need to stay aware of throughout. First, how do you draw nearby residents who are not really your core customer for a ballpark village? You probably can't see the photo on the lower right. Uh, those are three um, uh, elderly Cantonese residents of Chinatown uh, in Oakland, and it's an open question, how are you going to get those people to a ballpark village? What restaurant concept are you going to uh, include so as to attract that submarket? It is not an easy thing, right? Um, and the second point I want to make is really an extension of the first, that is, what role will the retail in the ballpark village play in this kind of broader competitive ecology? That is, how do we make retail in this ballpark village that is relevant to those residents, to their day-to-day -day lives, right? Um, uh, and that can realistically be provided in this sort of setting. Now, again, this is not an easy thing. Um, sorry, I went too far. Another point, and this is specifically relevant to this district, um, the reality is that if a ballpark village like this is developed adjacent to the Peralta headquarters site, right, it will potentially cannibalize what we already have, 
right? Well, we already have, even in Jack London Square, let's look at it. These ballpark villages, they often have multiplexes, right? Well, we have a multiplex in Jack London already. They often have something like a plank, right? At the, uh, in downtown Sacramento, the new Golden One Center, I can't believe that's what it's called, but the Golden One Center where the Sacramento Kings play, they're about to get a punch bowl social which is basically a small national chain that does exactly what the plank does, right? It's kind of like a big box entertainment venue um, with food and so on and so forth. Um, if there's one of those here, well, what does that mean for plank, right? Um, uh, and of course, restaurants and bars, which is one of the main selling points uh, of Jack London Square itself. Uh, so uh, there's, there's some vulnerability here for Jack London Square. Um, given what's usually in these sorts of projects. Finally, how do we balance this desire for something that is uniquely Oakland and that is locally rooted with the temptation to lease to more widely known, better capitalized operators? There's, uh, there's no shortage of the latter that want to be near sporting venues. I have a picture there you can't see of wall burgers. For those of you who don't watch the reality TV show, that's the burger chain that's been created by the Wahlberg brothers. Um, Mark, uh, God, I forgot the other two. One of them is a chef, anyway. And the other two are basically the faces. And they've been expanding across the country. And um, they are specifically looking at sporting venues, right? Um, and, and, and they would most likely be popular among game attendees. They would be far more appealing from a developer's perspective than an Oakland-based maker entrepreneur who has no credit record. Um, and they have said these are locations that they'd be interested in. Now this one right here is right outside Fenway Park on Yawkey Way, I'm sorry, it's been renamed David Ortiz Way. Um, but Wahlberg's is Boston, it's not Oakland. So what is that balance and how do we strike it as a practical matter? So that's just some food for thought um, from a retail perspective and now I'm gonna hand it to our next speaker. Uh, Noah. to celebrate, right? <laughs> I know that's not the official theme song for the A's anymore, but I'm old school uh, and I still love that song. Every time I hear it, I think I'm watching uh, one of the Bash Brothers hit a home run. Um, so why do I think it's time for celebrating? Okay, I guess I should say first and foremost, I am here representing myself. I am a senior urban designer uh, at Perkins & Will and I have no affiliation with the Oakland A's. Um, but why do I think uh, it's time to celebrate? I think one, because the A's are making a commitment to stay in Oakland, which is a really exciting thing. And two, that they have made a decision to integrate themselves into our city. I was born and raised in the East Bay. And when I wasn't playing baseball, I was playing with my Legos building cities. And in 1989, uh, my hero, Ricky Henderson, came back to the A's en route to winning the World Series. Um, and I remember it was October, and it's always hot in October here, right? And my family and I were settling in to watch the World Series, and everything changed. In an in instant, the last thing that was on anybody's minds was baseball. The Loma Prieta earthquake changed everything in our region. And what, I, what stuck with me since then is really how that was a moment where we came together as one community, the Bay Area. Not San Francisco, not Oakland. I guess we didn't know about San Jose yet. But we're one <laughs> Bay Area. We're one big city. Some things have changed. <laughs> the Giants got a new ballpark, and some things haven't changed. The A's are still playing in the Coliseum, and that there is some change there, too. 
Okay. And some other things have changed too. I grew up and I've had a career uh, uh, working at Piatok Architects here in Oakland designing affordable housing and, and then going on and being able to work at Perkins & Will as a senior urban designer and I get to work I get to work all over North America, and I've even gotten to work outside of North America, and so I'm really grateful for that. And uh, I get to work in Canada a bunch. For the last six years, I've been working in Ottawa and Toronto and Vancouver and Edmonton. And if you can't see this, this is the marketing campaign right now uh, for Canada. It's like the United States, but it's better. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure a few of you have probably looked into permanent residency recently. Um, I've, they've never been friendlier at the border. Okay, so we were asked by the city of Toronto to do a study for them on livability. And we're not, re we're not researchers, so we went and we found some other uh, groups that do great research. And we wanted to find out if people were thinking about what makes a livable city. And we were pretty shocked to find out that there are no livable cities that make the top of the list in the United States. And we were wondering, I mean, as urban designers, we're like, we got some pretty cool design cities, and Toronto's really freaking cold. <laughs> you know, we got great weather here, too. And so we looked, we, we cracked open the hood of these research studies and we identified what it was that was making these other cities livable. <laughs> they were safe from violent crime, which we have normalized. They have health care, which I heard our vice president say if fa it fails today, we're going to get Canadian style health care. So maybe things are getting better. <laughs> Cost of living, it's horrible here. Anyway. <laughs> Which is crazy, because look at the Bay Area. I mean, we are a global economy right here. And it is tough, because I think the Bay Area population equals the same as Mississippi, Alabama, um, Louisiana, and pick any one of your small states. And so that's eight senators versus zero. So we understand what's going on. But we have a problem that most regions and most communities probably would die for. We have out of control job growth, okay? So over the last five years, and this has been going on actually for 50 years. If you go to Berkeley, job growth over the last 50 years has been 300%. Housing growth is about five. And here it is for the Bay Area. Over the course of, since 1970 to 2015, our communities are approving less and less housing every year. What is behind that? I thought we were liberals and progressives. There are some pretty smart professors down, down in UCLA that have a pretty good idea that this has to do with some sort of desire to keep certain people out of our communities. So we have a choice. <laughs> I don't think anybody's picking number one, right? Do we really want to stop job growth in the Bay Area? So it's number two. Well, you can't just have housing growth and job growth without taking care. And I love going to the dictionary for words. What's the definition of gentrification? It sounds not so terrible, renewal, rebuilding but it oftentimes displaces poor residents. And we're seeing that. But often doesn't always mean, often doesn't mean always, does it? You can't see this, but it's happening right now. And this is, these are the professors that I was talking about at UCLA and Berkeley. They've come up with a mapping system to show where there is where there are places that are undergoing displacement and have advanced gentrification. And the dark blue is advanced gentrification. The light blue is undergoing displacement. That's here, right now. It's happening right now. I didn't really actually know that. Did you? They don't. So why should we? We cannot continue to ignore this problem. Whether you are an affordable housing advocate, or you're a developer, or you're an elected official, or you're a designer, 
we cannot ignore that problem anymore. And there's another way. I have seen the light, and um, my beautiful wife's from Mexico, and this is as far north as she goes, unfortunately. So just an idea. I think that increased density will help us to reduce displacement from gentrification. And my kids and I put this video together to explain the concept. If we have the existing unprotected residents and we fill them with new wealthier residents, we're definitely going to have displacement. But if you were to put protections on existing residents and then you were to actually increase development with dedicated affordable housing, you don't get displacement. And I would just say to folks, in the meantime, let's go ahead and do some future planning because people are not going to stop coming to the Bay Area. It's great and the weather's getting better. Okay, and there's a lot of space. This is a little sneak preview of some pro bono work that we've been doing at Perkins of Will. We were somewhat appalled with the downtown specific plan process and we really wanted to figure out if you could do something like this, you can. Okay, okay, I'll be honest and I'll just throw my cards on the table. I like the Laney site. <laughs> I played baseball at Laney. I mean, I don't think that should, I shouldn't play the Laney card, I guess, but I do like the Laney site for a lot of reasons. But I also think the Howard Terminal site's pretty cool. They're both uh, at the edge of downtown, but Laney is definitely more transit oriented. It's direct, directly adjacent to BART. It's got great freeway access, but do you know that the original home of the A's had no parking? And more than half of the Bay Area lives within a 40 minute ride on BART to the new Laney site. So couldn't we have a baseball stadium without parking? I mean, forget about BART. There's a whole def a different me a whole menu of options for how to get to a stadium besides driving. And uh, what can this, you know, what can this ballpark do for Laney? If you haven't been paying attention to the news, Laney's in trouble. Remember what we don't do in this country? We don't fund education. We just don't, especially a community college in Oakland. It's leaking, it's falling apart, it needs help. And there's a channel there that used to be part, you know, connecting the estuary and, and I think we can, you know, what can that ballpark do to improve that condition? How could that ballpark connect Lake Merritt to the estuary in a way that we really have never seen ever before. But, and so I'm hopeful. I want to celebrate, but I've got some questions for the A's and everyone in this room should ask the A's these questions every time they show up. <laughs> are they authentic or are they just playing lip service to us? Who's calling the shots? I think we can all agree, Dave Cavill's awesome. He seems like such a good guy. He's got open office hours. Hey John, why do you even own a baseball team? Is it a vanity project, like Miami? Or is it something of a legacy, like in Pittsburgh? <laughs> Are we going to suffer an international star architect parachuting in from outside? Or are they going to actually come up with a team that's rooted in Oakland? What are your legally binding agreements? I get the economic impact story. I'm sure when they built the original Coliseum, there was a similar study. Maybe not as great of a number, but if you've been there recently, didn't seem to help at all. So we need legally binding community agreements. How are you gonna protect the existing residents in the surrounding neighborhoods? How much affordable housing are you gonna dedicate? The Giants did 
small and local businesses? What kind of dedication and subsidy are you, the A is going to provide to local businesses to locate at this ballpark village? And then how much are they actually going to fund that improvement at Laney? So I want to celebrate, but I've got a lot of questions, and I hope you all do too. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. I appreciate that. So we have some um, questions that were mailed into us in advance. Uh, a few of these questions, some of the speakers have already dealt with. So I'm going to skip over those, but I'll go to the first one here. It's uh, how should a city weigh and choose support uh, one potentially competing need over another, such as housing versus a ballpark? Um, Jeff, Noah, either one of you guys want to handle that? Uh, Oakland obviously has a um, a great, the Bay Area has a great need for more housing. Does it really need a ballpark in Oakland? I would, actually, one of, the, one of the major opportunities that <clears throat> does come from relocating the ballpark downtown is that the Coliseum site becomes completely open for any type of development. And there, there is a Coliseum City plan um, to bring in more housing, to bring in commercial development there. I mean, that, that then becomes the major East Bay site for more housing. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's one or the other. Um, Oakland does have plans to create more dense housing. Obviously, it could be denser. You should give our presentation for the Bay Area Council, by the way. We are always on the, the dense housing train, so <laughs> come on over. Yeah. So, but do you think that the, a, a ballpark at the Laney side, for example, will spur more housing in that area? Um, you know, years ago, Jerry Brown, his main argument against a ballpark in, in the Uptown District is he said, you know, I don't think it's going to spur housing in the area. I just think we should build housing. Um, it's turned out that Uptown, you know, was completely revitalized as a result of the new housing that went in there. Um, can a ballpark do it? If we, do we have any examples of that? I don't think so. Well, and I think <clears throat> one, one other point to add, you know, you were talking about East Village in San Diego where there has been an enormous mm -hmm. amount of housing development uh, surrounding Pecto Park. Um, you know, and the question which I'm sure that you analyze as part of these studies is to what extent would that housing development have occurred regardless? Um, and, and, and on the other hand, uh, to what extent was the stadium itself a driver for more housing than would have otherwise been built? Um, you know, and I, th I think that's another way of, of, of looking at it. Uh, obviously, Oakland is building a lot of housing in downtown. Well, some's going up and a lot more is, is going through the process. So um, to what extent will it really change what's going to happen anyway or what seems like it's about to happen? I don't know. You know, we do a lot of, actually, we did this with the Giants. Um, when we were doing the development for Mission Rock, uh, our, cli our client and the community members came to us and they said, okay, we're interested, but we don't understand drawings and we don't understand numbers, so what's going to happen here? And we're like, well, wait a second, that's what we do. And we realized that what we, so what we did is we did a series of neighborhood studies and we've actually kicked off a multi-year research pro project for our firm um, where we're looking at what makes an urban, what, ma what makes a vibrant urban neighborhood. And it turns out it's not, <clears throat> It's not happenstance. There are, it's like a great meal. There's ingredients, there's a recipe, and then you have served up this really, really great meal. And one of the things that we know is that urban vibrancy comes from people living in close proximity to transit, especially. Um, and so there's, about a, there's a threshold of about 20,000 people per square mile within a certain walking distance of BART. And if you want to see what that looks like, Berkeley, downtown Berkeley, just passed that threshold. Down, none of the stations in downtown Oakland are above 10,000 people per square mile. So I don't necessarily, so let's imagine if there had been a ballpark at Uptown. Let's do that game, like, like, let's go there. You wouldn't have gotten to the urban vibrancy that we have now. Okay, so that said, I'm excited to see the A's try and do this. I think they should go down the 35,000 person stadium, do a 20,000 person stadium, and really commit to doing the housing and mixed use development 
and make sure you have a legally binding agreement. Well, by the way, you're not going to get approved without that legally binding agreement for affordable housing and, and protections for the neighborhoods around there. So I, I mean, I don't think the ballpark in and of itself can drive housing. I don't think that we should say no to the ballpark because we're afraid of it. I think let's, this is a great opportunity. Again, there's so much bad stuff going on right now and so much bad news. Like, let's make this a good news story, how we made the ballpark we wanted and got the neighborhood we wanted. I know this, this is going to come up um, from a lot of residents, uh, and I hear it in my job a lot, um, from readers. So with ballparks moving downtown, and if this ballpark's moved downtown, how can a city mitigate the traffic that this ballpark is going to create? <laughs> no parking. Mm -hmm. they, you can't let them have parking. You just can't. So you, you basically want to force them, force I mean, the fans into there taking There could be a net transit. zero. There could be net zero parking because you do have the Laney students and a lot of them do rely on driving and because they're working moms and they're, you know, they're folks that are trying to, you know, make it and we don't want to penalize them. But, you know, well, come on, we're moving into a new, I mean, we're past parking. And quite honestly, since we started the project with the Giants, the demand that they're projecting for parking goes down every single year. And now they're looking at their 7,000 car parking garage and thinking, let's not build that till the end. And maybe we won't need parking at the end and we'll entitle it for the highest intensity development because that potentially is going to be a stop on the California high-speed rail and it's going to be the intersection between the second tube and the high-speed rail. So here we are at Lake Merritt. I, I know, pretty fantastic view <laughs> of the world. I mean, maybe if we were north of the border, that would be happening. But I just say, you can't, parking equals cars. I think the, the other part of that is incentivizing the use of those alternative travel modes, whether that's partnering with BART, partnering with an Uber and a Lyft, partnering with the city to make sure that the bike lanes are in place making sure that there are bus routes connecting BART in the stadium, connecting downtown in the stadium, connecting even West Oakland BART in the stadium. So it's, it's enabling those different types of travel that, that can make that no parking a reality. Yeah, yeah we, and, and I, I, I have to kind of disagree with you there. I, 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 I agree that the, the, the sheer amount of parking that you see surrounding these suburban 60s era stadiums is, 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 is beyond excessive. Uh, I, I do think going, going straight away to zero uh, is not only unprecedented, but a, a little premature. Um, you know, especially that this is a team which, well, they're not exactly the biggest draw right now, and everyone likes to think it's just because of the stadium. Uh, I don't think that's their, their only or even their major problem, you know. And so to give, you know, the reality, the, the, the cup of water analogy, which was an excellent one, um, holds here, people are, jobs are going to come here, people are gonna move here, and people are gonna to drive to the stadium, um, whether we like it or not. Less than perhaps was envisioned 50 years ago, but probably to some degree still, and especially that it's an unknown part of the city. I think all those Tri-Valley, Walnut Creek um, residents are, are probably gonna feel a little more comfortable, at least at first, in their cars. So I don't know if dropping it to zero I know that's an opening bargain. They're not my clients. I get it. So. I get it. <laughs> what, you know, you, we usually start our projects there, but our clients convince us that no, they need parking. No, I, I, I get that it's an opening salvo. <laughs> that bar, the bar station there is also on the small side, right, Robert? Right. Right. 
Um, kind of dovetailing on that, we got a lot of questions from folks about uh, infrastructure and whether or not this is something that the city and maybe Peralta and BART get involved in. And that is, you know, the mayor ha committed uh, $200 million in infrastructure funding for the Oakland Raiders if they were to have stayed in Oakland and not moved to Las Vegas. Uh, she's expected to make the same offer to the A's um, at whatever site they picked. Uh, is that something that, you know, a city, is that, is that a good use of funds or a good use of um, effort? That won't go as far at the Laney site, right? Well, the Laney site is going to need, still going to need yeah. infrastructure upgrades. It's going to need, it's going to need a new off-ramp and on-ramp to I-80. Yeah, it might well, I don't know. Howard Terminal is going to be expensive, too, probably. Okay. Um, you know, and if you want to expand the BART station, it's potentially the issue. The, the plan that the, uh, the city put forward for the Raiders actually um, was interesting. They, they wanted to create an infrastructure financing district. Yeah. This is a new entity that the state created uh, after uh, uh, the legislature kill, killed redevelopment. And so this is a district that would be created by the property owners of that area, and it could very well be if they just do, you know, the city of Oakland property, Peralta property, and BART property, just those public entities, and the public entities themselves would be the, the creators of this district, and then that district would have the ability to sell bonds to pay for infrastructure, and it wouldn't actually put um, the, the public agencies at that risk. Mm. Yeah, which is great too. Yeah. Well, I think paying for infrastructure is obviously better than paying for the stadium itself. Like mm -hmm. In all of these stadium conversations that are positive and negative, every city is subsidizing a stadium through tax credits or direct funding. In this case, the, the A's have already said this will be a privately financed stadium. So if you're comparing those two, the infrastructure investments are obviously something that can be used by people that are not just attending the game. That makes Oakland a, a better place to, to live and to move around. Um, Mike or Jeff, this might be a good question for you. Um, what's the best way to make sure the impact is a, of a ballpark is positive and not a force of displacement or disruption? I know that's probably going to be an issue going forward here in Oakland. You know, the, the A's have already said that they're going to be working with the community college district and the city for the next year to figure this project out. I think that that partnership is key with the city to understand what development makes sense for that area, whether it's dense residential, whether it's some type of retail, whether it's office buildings on the ground floor and residential on top. I, I think there are a number of different ways that this can play out, but it's that working together with the city that's important. A lot of people have mentioned the Miami example yeah. as a terrible one. I mean, that, that was literally just everything was promised, but nothing was guaranteed, and they ended up with a stadium with four parking garages around it in the middle of Little Havana. A few extra jobs. No one is staying to go to restaurants or bars. It's it's entirely its own its own little ecosystem there. So I think it's important making sure that this does benefit the entire city and the entire neighborhood. Have yeah. you seen any examples in your research um, at all of cities that have uh, tried to protect small businesses and help them benefit from this? Because I mean, we all figure that we're going to get new business with this, new restaurants, new bars that are gonna to open to serve the A's fans and maybe whatever else develops along with it. But what about the folks that are already here and how do we make sure they're not left out? Yeah, I mean, it's um, <clears throat> obviously I'm wading into a <laughs> potential minefield with this one, but um, you know, I, I think in as much as retail is concerned, there's obviously a difference of opinion even within Chinatown itself about to what extent this will help or hinder its small businesses. Um, uh, the, uh, I don't know if he's self-proclaimed, but the mayor of Chinatown is all for this, thinking that it's going to be a boon for small businesses. And I, I think the, the real question is, are these fans um, gonna be ones who, who patronize businesses in Chinatown? Um, uh, and, and you know, and that, and that I think is an open question. Um, if they're not getting any increased business from that foot traffic, and yet their, you know, the costs are rising, um, you know, that that's that's uh, not a sustainable sort of situation. I do think that um, one way to make this at least the retail component of it something that is how we in Oakland 
as like to think of um, ourselves is to say, you know, we're going to be the first ballpark village where there's going to be retail that actually is relevant to these surrounding neighborhoods in a day-to-day -day sort of way. Again, that's very hard to see what the overlap is between the day-to-day -day needs of Chinatown East Lake residents and the desires of people heading to a ball game or a concert or what have you. Um, you know, is there a potential overlap? But if there is, if we can identify it and it, if it can be executed, uh, that would be a first. That would be somewhat unprecedented because, you know, Jeff, it's, it's, it's again, the, the examples of where this, that sort of crossover has been achieved are slim to none. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you know of the quote unquote Chinatown that exists near uh, what was the Verizon Center in, in downtown Washington, D.C. Uh, it's about as Chinatown, all, all it has right now is, is, is a pagoda, basically, to say that it's a Chinatown. <laughs> it's not a real functioning Chinatown, hadn't been for a long time. But, you know, the examples of where this has been done, few and far between. It can be something that's a uniquely Oakland achievement, though, and one that would speak to who we feel we want to be or who we feel we are. So, oh, go ahead. I've been collecting your questions, and I've still gotten note, note cards. Um, you have a lot of uh, overlapping questions, so that is that that's great. And I'm going to let Robert kind of weed through them and and pick them as he sees fit. So um, don't feel hurt if they're worded slightly differently. There they might be a merger of several different questions. Thanks. Actually, let me ask one more question here from the previous list. Um, uh, Noah, this is maybe for you. Um, how does Oakland or maybe the A's or the designers make sure that the ballpark doesn't feel like a cookie cutter version of a, every other stadium in the country and that it really represents Oakland, that it's rooted in Oakland? Uh, can you give us some design ideas of what that might look like? Um, well, I think it's a good start to get Dave Cavill on board because I think the Aveda Stadium Mm -hmm. is it's pretty cool and I think what I like about it the most well first of all I, I'm I'm expecting that Dave's gonna have a little bit of a, a shock when he realizes this is not developing a stadium next to the airport in San Jose you know this is actually inside of a, you're integrating yourself into a community and I really don't think we've seen that uh, done since you know, the era of Scheib Park in Philadelphia. And what's so cool about the game of baseball is it actually designed to fit inside of a city block. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So, and stadiums back then were 20,000 or 25,000 at most. And if you look at the pictures of the outfield, it's public, it's open. So what about that? I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, this, so Aveda Stadium, Dave Cavill did so great because it's like a little pop-up stadium. It's not really a stadium. It looks like an erector set. And, you know, it's very small, and it's got a small capacity. And there is, at the end zone, there's this place where you can just go without a ticket. So I think for the stadium design, I would think that you would look, beyond, you know, back to the first uh, stadiums that were designed because they're really the most urban. Um, I think you'd be careful about the architect that you hire, um, and I think that you would really uh, try and find opportunities to open that ballpark up to the public as much as possible. So that's the ballpark design. And then I think just the ballpark village pr part of it, it's got to be like a city. I mean, you've got to design it as part of the city, an integrated part of the city. And, uh, you know, one thing that we're doing with the Giants, um, and it's based on the work that we did on the ferry building, was with the ground floor retail, the developer of the ferry building purposely uh, has kept the rents low. So they, they, they subsidize the rents or they keep them low so they can maintain small and local businesses in there. And, and so the Giants actually have taken that model and they're going to, they've, their commitment is to uh, curate, uh, to, to maintain the ground floor retail and lease the upper floors. And what we saw in the ferry building is that those, the rents on the upper floors were much higher because you had these great small and local businesses. You had Heath Tile and Blue Bottle Coffee and you, you know, your uh, uh, just uh, Hog Island Oyster. 
Um, so you have Everett and Jones on the ground floor. Um, so I think it's, it's a combination of those and just really being a lot more sensitive than I think we've seen, even with the Giants. And there's still room for, if, the, if you look at the Giants ballpark across the street, there's the big cantina that's empty all the time except for when it's game day and those folks that don't want to go to your small local business, they fill that up and the rest of the year it's just empty and that's just, that's just a reality. So I think those are some thoughts. There's a, I think this is a question kind of dovetails off that. Um, if the ballpark m village means that retail might be cannibalized, why not just build the ballpark only so that the Jack London district will flourish? Uh, I mean, I could, I could take a stab at that one. I, I think I'd have uh, two answers to that. One, um, uh, you know, generally speaking, um, uh, throughout history, people seem to be only willing to walk so far <laughs> from A to B, right? And those small developers weren't dumb. It's about the distance from the ring road surrounding a mall to the entrance, right? That's why the parking lot to a mall is, is the size it is. And so, you know, whether um, Jack London Square is within that, that walking distance, I don't believe it is. And certainly on a psychological level, and, and Noah, you could speak to this, it's not. I mean, the way it's even being framed now is it's part of Chinatown and Eastlake. No one's really mentioning Jack London. So I think um, that's, that's, that would be a challenge right there. In terms of why the stadium can't just be built as a freestanding sort of facility, and, and Jeff, you might have some more to say about this too, you know, and I think this gets to some of what you said, Noah. Um, this team, um, whether it's a vanity or posterity project, um, to some extent they do, they do need to monetize this. To, to use a, you know, a potentially objectionable term. They do need to monetize this, not to the hilt, but uh, to the point where they can justify the investment and also put a competitive product out there and not basically trade away every single player who gets any good. Um, you know, the, in the end, this is a baseball team. So I think those are considerations we do need to keep in mind, um, that we do want to give them some leash here to make the money that we need them to make for this to be successful for them. Uh, and that's not a very Bay Area way of thinking. We're very either or, confrontational with developers or big business, but the reality is we want them to be happy too. Um, and we want them to put together a winning team uh, and not be trading away their stars at the trade deadline every year. So, you know, I, I think those are also considerations. And uh, there's, there's not necessarily any guarantee that if the A's didn't build it, that someone else would. I right. mean, we're talking potentially 10 years from now, we could be in a recession, Oakland could look entirely different. So I think in doing it this way, you're creating an entire neighborhood as part of the city and at least can start the beginning of having other developers come in and build, whether it's residential, commercial, or retail. All right. And I, I mean, I just would say that we're, we're fighting over crumbs here. I mean, as I pointed out, we do not, we do not live in a livable city, okay? We don't have, we don't trust our government, and as a result, we are not getting any benefits of what a government can give us or what we can give ourselves. So uh, if I just think about Vancouver and I think about Yale Town, um, which is the equivalent of Jack London, there's, there's a subway stop there in Yale Town, like literally two blocks from the water. And when we read Oakland and we do our transit overlays and we think about where should you direct development in Oakland, I gotta say it's not Jack London area because it's not transit accessible. And transit accessible literally means two and a half minute walk to BART. And so if we say, we're not getting any more I mean, I don't see it happening in the near term, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is a revolution around the corner and we're going to become a socialist country. But we literally fought a war to get out of the Commonwealth, so I'm not sure we're going to try and get back in. And I don't see that coming, so we have three BART stations in downtown Oakland and they are all underperforming in terms of density around them. And Lake Merritt is actually the worst performer. Yeah. And so you have to bump up the density there. It's got at least double or triple. And with that density is going to come retail. And, you know, I'm hoping that at some point we invest in some transit infrastructure to make Jack London more accessible. 
I don't know if you guys know the answer to this question. I'm not sure it's been said, but do we have any um, indication from other cities whether Major League Baseball would contribute at all to the ballpark, the building of it? I know football, NFL helps teams I, pay for new stadiums. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it um, probably have to be in the inner circle of MLB to know. I, 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 just being a fanatical baseball fan myself, I, I wouldn't imagine that Major League Baseball is in any mood to do any favors for the Oakland Athletics. Because, uh, you know, it, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's not as bad as the NFL and Al Davis, but, um, uh, you know, it's a team which has, for a long time, been making money and constantly pointed to small market for the reason why they can't be more, uh, be more aggressive in signing players and keeping players. I don't, I don't know if, it's, if it's, it's a team that they want to feel like they are at all subsidizing. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but that's... That's from someone who's just speculating from the outside. I also can't think of any examples off the top for Major League Baseball. I mean, the, the Giants completely financed their own right, ballpark, right? Right. right. Okay, this one's kind of shifts gears over to housing a little bit. Uh, this questioner asks, so at 200000 to $300,000 per unit for affordable housing needed for subsidy, maybe even more than that, how is it possible to offset displacement or provide significant numbers of affordable units? Um, in the area. There's, there are concerns from residents that if, um, you know, the ballpark goes in, it could uh, really raise the land values in the area around it. Um, that could have, the property could change hands, people pay more for that property and want to raise rents if those, that housing is not um, protected by rent control. And if, I mean, I'll jump in. Currently, you have that small glass. You have unprotected housing. I mean, what you have out here that's developed block by block, building by building, or the existing housing stock is unprotected, right? So in a way, the way, the way that I see it, and this is again just my opinion on this and the way that I'm reading this, is that probably our best chance to create dedicated affordable housing is through new large scale development because that is a place where you can create legally binding agreements that you have this dedicated affordable housing in perpetuity. Because as of, as of right now, if you look at the Mission District or if you look at Oakland, without those new developments, you're getting displacement anyway. So it's like, if we keep hiding our head in the sand, it's gonna happen. So we got to change our mentality. And it's not to say that, and I, that's what my point was at the beginning, is not development isn't good. Development's not going to stop the displacement. It's development with stuff, with the restrictions, with the protections, with the legally binding agreements that this is going to be affordable housing. And I would also say that in our work in Canada, it's not just about, uh, it, there's not just a, a requirement for a certain affordable housing, and that's at different levels. So, you know, affordable housing means nothing, by the way. Mark, Mark uh, Zuckerberg, he has access to affordable housing all the time because it really just means that you pay 30% of your income towards housing. We're talking about government subsidized housing. Sorry, I know that's like the bad word we're not allowed to say anymore, but it is actually about subsidizing housing. There, so that's inclusionary housing happens when we get the developers to subsidize it. There is government subsidized housing. We call it affordable housing. So that's for extremely low income folks. And then there's rent protections. And then in Canada, the other thing that we do is uh, there has to be dedicated rental housing, long-term rental housing. So you just don't get condo neighborhoods. And a big part of the conversation needs to be, as you mentioned, dense big developments that are market rate developments mostly. And then the affordable housing comes with that at 20% or 40% for the giants. So it's not a market rate versus affordable conversation. We need to be building both because you have the people that should be in market rate homes then competing with the homes that are more affordable, not subsidized, but more affordable. Yeah, and I mean, mixed income communities are the healthiest communities mm -hmm. that exist. I mean, one, uh, imagine if you're a low income kid and you're growing up in a mixed income community and you get to meet your neighbor and that neighbor happens to work in an office and is a professional and that person can mentor you. 
Upward mobility in our society does not occur when we stratify our neighborhoods. <coughs> Mixed income neighborhoods are critical, and I think that we, the, the more we shut down development, the more we're gonna stratify our society. Um, Robert, maybe this is another question for you. Um, do you know, has there been any initial discussion between the A's and the city and adjacent um, uh, developments, including BART? Um, and is there an idea out there, some kind of proposal to try to create some kind of master development around this idea? I haven't been at that table. Okay. So I'm suggesting that uh, Chinese night markets, as exist in uh, Vancouver, could be a natural element to weave into the architecture. Um, but in terms of baking, baking this pie, uh, the ingredients are all being assembled now. Right. And then we'll put it together and figure out what it, what it will cost. And we know that the A's are motivated because they're going to lose that Major League Baseball revenue sharing agreement, I think by 2020. Yeah, so they, they have to come up with a way that this whole thing will pencil out. And it has to work for them and for the community. Uh, Noah, this one's uh, directed specifically at you. Uh, this uh, questioner says, I don't trust any sports team owner to respect a local community ever since the Dodgers left Brooklyn. <laughs> O'Malley scarred millions of people for life, so how can we ma muster support to keep the A's and make the owners be respectful to Oakland? How should we organize constructively and not just agonize? Don't trust the ball, don't trust the team. <laughs> I, I think that's r totally reasonable. Trust the agreement. I mean, I, you know, I, I think there's certainly um, a place for ensuring that agreements are, are, uh, are uh, adhered to. Um, uh, that said, you know, I, I grew up with two parents who uh, bemoaned the loss of the Dodgers um, from Ebbets Field. Uh, and one thing I'll say is that, you know, not a, just because Walter O'Malley didn't, doesn't mean John Fisher and Dave Cavell are going to do it. And I, I will say that um, he, you know, they have already shown some commitment. And um, you know, rather than continuing that sort of confrontational posture, you know, maybe um, trying to deepen that sort of uh, emerging kind of uh, ethic of, of, of cooperation might be at least attitudinally um, the more constructive path. But that's, you know, that's, I know that's, again, I, I tend to think all of these questions become so confrontational, binary, them or us, bad or good, and I just, I don't think that's a way to see the world, uh, nor is it really a very nuanced way of understanding it. So I, I just, I would give them some points for what they've been willing to do so far. But we do have examples around the country, right? I mean, the, the Miami example keeps coming up tonight, um, that's obviously a cautionary tale. You yeah. know, what can the residents of a city or business owners or, or whomever is here 
what can they do to try to make sure that that doesn't actually occur in Oakland? It seems like Dave Cavill and the A's aren't really interested in doing that, yeah. but we don't know what the final plan is going to be until the final plan is there. And he has office hours, and they, I feel like they've been around at restaurants around Oakland, talking right. to people, trying to figure out what the community wants. Um, you know, I, I guess it's kind of interesting that we started this conversation with the A's thinking about moving to Fremont or San yeah. Jose. Yes. The A's are staying here. But that like, was Lou Wolf. That was a different man. It's, it's a different yeah. man, but the, this is an Oakland asset, and I think the point is that it's a private entity. The A's are. They're not owned by Oakland, but they're creating an asset that the entire community can use and benefit from, and I think that's where your voices come in and making sure that those benefits are the right ones. And I really, I mean, I... You know, I have a fantasy land vision of this ballpark, and it's amazing. And it's a, I mean, this is, again, like I said, there's so much bad news out there right now. Can we make this a good news story? Right. And I am hopeful. I really do appreciate Dave Cavill's approach. I love the hashtag rooted in Oakland. I love the murals. I love the office hours. I really love the site, too. Um, I just, I, I do think, though, Look, this is not, I think they, I'm hoping that John Fisher especially, but Dave Cavill is his front man, they do get it that this is a privilege. Because I honestly do think Jerry Brown was on to something. Yeah. I don't think Oakland needs the A's per se. I think it's great and it would be fabulous. And if we had Scheib Park down there with a night market and some housing and affordable housing and protected small local, local businesses, next to BART with no parking. I mean, you guys see where I'm going here? It's amazing. And this could be the place where it happens, but it's really the crew that's here. You know, this is our city. How do we design the stadium the way we want it to design? And so I do agree, let's not be 100% confrontational. Maybe we need to give something. What do we need to give? A s easier process? <laughs> I mean, the reason why we're not getting development in the Bay Area is because our communities are stifling development. Mm. So, well, I mean, if that's how we want it, we're not going to get the A's, and we're not going to get the affordable housing, and we're not going to get the local and small businesses, and your kids are not going to live here anymore. So again, it's just like, I don't want to be confrontational, but, and I think it's the A's have to take the first step, and they have taken a step, and, mm. and so let's, let's reward them. I think the rollout was not as good as it could have been for the Laney site. Uh, I think Dave Cavill got quoted as saying it's good for private financing. Probably not the only thing he said in that interview, but it was definitely the most provocative thing to write about. So give him a chance, I guess. Michael, we were talking about this a little bit before the meeting started tonight. You know, isn't there a real possibility here if the A's build at Laney that the entire area between the Laney site and downtown could see an attraction of new businesses and new restaurants and bars and maybe retail serving people who are, you know, either living in downtown or, or actually working in downtown or want to just get off at Barton downtown and, and make the walk down to Laney. Yeah, I, and I think that's a particularly exciting prospect. Um, it doesn't uh, leverage the, the, <laughs> the investment in the Lake Merritt Bart as much, but if someone were to say take BART to, you know, one of the two uh, stops on Broadway and then uh, proceed, you know, to walk, um, you know, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, uh, I guess that would be uh, east. Um, yeah, and then ultimately provide support in the form of additional consumer demand for businesses that are already or would be catering to existing Chinatown residents. That would be an exciting prospect. And there's certainly some precedent for that sort of overlap, right? Like, right. Um, especially when it's food. I mean, we all go to places we'd otherwise never even consider um, for food, right? Um, and uh, so there certainly seems to be that, that opportunity. Um, you know, to, it also depends on the property owners along that route. and whether they see greater opportunity um, with those additional streams of foot traffic and then raise, raise ground floor rents accordingly right. and right. what that does to the existing base of businesses. That, that's, 
that would be, you know, kind of the flip side of that, that it would cause speculation. And, and that depends on the property owners themselves. And, and it, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, we're getting kind of close to wrap up time here. Maybe we're actually past it. Um, should we go through kind of a closing thought for everyone? Yeah. Start down at the end, maybe? Oh, man. I, I guess I, I'm really excited about the site like you. I think that the economic potential for the entire city of Oakland, not just around Lake Merritt, not just how it might affect Jack London, but how that really makes the city of Oakland attractive for employers, for people moving here. Uh, and we got to think about the displacement issues and we got to think about the, the potential negative traffic impacts. Um, but, but really this new stadium becomes a magnet for spending and if it used the right way, uh, really can help Oakland grow going forward. I was uh, fortunate enough to get home today and pick up my youngest son, Tito, from uh, school and getting him ready for soccer practice and he could not get his sock on and he could not get his shoe on and he was upset and he was like, I can't do this, I can't do this. And I was just like, you know what Barack Obama said? <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> we can do this. Let's show the rest of the country and the world that we can do this. I think what's exciting to me is from a retail perspective, you look at this sort of ballpark village and there are three possible outcomes, right? One is the typical Cordish ballpark village, which uh, is uh, relatively generic from city to city. Uh, the second is um, a ballpark village that feels like a certain version of the Bay Area. And so you'll get, uh, you know, you'll get your blue bottle, co I'm sorry, your Nestle owned blue bottle coffee um, and you'll get your other uh, supposedly homegrown artisanal businesses that are in fact extremely expensive and inaccessible to most people. Um, or three, you get something which truly does have this sort of overlap and which I do feel is something would be uniquely Oakland. Um, I hope for the third. Um, I, I, I think it's possible, but it will require some deliberate thought and, and, and initiative and will uh, to make that happen. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this is a, it's been a long conversation. It's been going on for 20 years about the A's and their odyssey for a new ballpark. Uh, I assume it's going to continue going on for a while. Even Dave Cavill said on forum the other day that he expected the ballpark wouldn't open until 2023 at the earliest. And I think that might be a little uh, ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll be having more conversations like this. The East Bay Express and Oakland Magazine will soon be writing about it a lot in the years to come. So uh, thanks, for everybody, for coming tonight. Thanks for sure. Thank, yeah, thank you all for coming, and uh, we always like to have this in unusual venues. Thanks for your patience with this unusual ven venue, and thank you so much to our fantastic panelists. Thank and thank you, Savlin, for putting this on.